Welcome everyone to Video Chess Training on YouTube. My name is William Pascal. I'm an international master from the United States who lives in Budapest, Hungary. Today we're going to start a new series I've entitled Grandmaster Lessons from the Past. These are older games, not really recent ones, which are very instructive for one reason or another. The first one I've started with uh, for today's video is Sarah Wan versus Ye Jiang Chuan. This is a game from, I believe, 2003, played in the King's Chess Tournament in China. This was uh, going back, well, now 14 years. Sir Wan is a legendary kind of strategic player who's pretty inactive nowadays. And this was one of the first very, very strong Chinese grandmasters, Ye Jing Chuan. Um, this is a player who was 2680, I think at least, and um, perhaps he's become inactive now, maybe active as a trainer in Chinese chess, I'm not sure. But these two guys were very, very strong at the time this game was played in 2003. Yasser Serwan, of course, an American grandmaster. He's playing white with d4. My personal experiences against Yasser, it's usually an unpleasant kind of positional squeeze. And uh, it's never, never fun to play with him. So Yasser is white. Uh, Yang Ji Chuan is black. This is knight f6, c4, and g6. Again, this game was played in China in 2003. You can probably find it in any major chess database. Yasser is playing white. And Yasser is pretty easy to prepare for here because he actually plays or frequently played a variation that's quite rare. This was his specialty. So in the classical King's Indian, after bishop g7, e4, Yasser plays after d6, bishop d3. This should be called the Sirawan variation. I guess in some modern sources, perhaps it is. I'm not sure if, if other famous players really played it before Yasser, but he's done the most to make this variation into kind of a standard line. Even today, it's had some popularity in recent years, and I, I found it personally difficult um, to deal with as, as black. I lost one game in the last 10 years. I remember the last time I faced this against Grandmaster Prohashka Peter when I was black, very difficult game against him. So it's a good, solid positional setup for white. Basically, the idea, basically the idea is to put the bishop on d3 and play knight e2. You may or may not play f3 at some point. You may or may not develop your bishop to g5. You may develop to e3. So white has some flexibility. You could also play h3. Makes it interesting that white has different ways to set up the king's knight, the bishop. Usually the knight does go to e3. Um, Yasser also perhaps sometimes plays systems like the same-ish with white, which are sort of interrelated. Um, castles, and now knight on g to e2. And... Jing Chuan here plays knight to c6. This is considered to be the main line. There are a couple of reasons why black is playing knight c6 rather than, say, a standard move like e5. He's trying to lure this pawn forward, possibly, and, and possibly the knight could go to b4, hunting that bishop on b, d3 in some variations. But black wants to play e5 at some point. He's waiting for the right moment to do so. So now we have castles and e5. Now, there is another very interesting line here we see in the opening explorer, knight h5 in this position. That is, I believe, a move that was known at the time this game was played, but later perhaps became even more popular. A very interesting sort of hypermodern approach. Blacks put pressure, putting pressure on the center. I mean, Yasser played this variation for years, and um, you know, when he first started to play the line, probably no one had any ideas like knight h5, but that's a very, very interesting possibility here. Um, black plays e5, this is more standard. You can see even relatively recent games, even Chuck versus Win Nok Twangson, um, a player who I played quite a few times. There's a 2015 game, Ivan Chuck won with white. I didn't know that when was playing the King's Indian, he was a Queen's Indian player, so maybe he's out of his element there a little bit. Or maybe he's just grown. Uh, we see Aronian versus Nakamura, Aronian. Uh, D5, and now Knight to D4. This is the major difference from like the classical lines of of the King's Indian, where you know you play the Marta Plata variation, and the Knight goes to E7. 
I can remember old games from the 90s, Yasser against Fedorovic. Um, mostly white played knight takes d4 and knight to b5. This is a very well-known variation. Knight takes d4, e takes d4, knight to b5, sometimes knight e2. And this pawn on d4 is kind of a weakness, but it's also sort of menacing and disrupting white's position. Normally black gets enough counterplay with something like rook to e8, pressuring the e4 pawn. We see some draws there. Aronian, um, Alexandrov, strong players playing black as well. So this line is still being discussed as recently as a few years ago. But Yasser's choice is interesting. You know, he plays bishop g5, and this is something of a side variation. But I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, the structure is very solid for white. He's hoping to play kind of in Petrosian system style with, uh, with bishop g5, maybe slowing down black's intentions on the king's side. I think that this is a very, very interesting alternative. It also doesn't trade pieces. And uh, we see the game itself, of course, there. We also see Ivan Sokolov beating uh, Katronius as recently as 2009 in the same variation. Uh, what else do we have here? Miroshnichenko, very aggressive player, losing. Not surprising, he seems to always win or lose. And Alexander Neneshev also played it against Katronius. Okay, so bishop g5, h6, bishop h4. And then black, of course, doesn't really want to weaken his structure completely with with g5. So it looks like the majority of players have, have played c5 in this position, just reinforcing that knight at d4, which I think that makes sense, you know, securing this knight on d4. And then we see a, a game here, Yasser played against John Nunn in 1992. Interesting. So this really goes back. He played rook b1 against Nunn, and that was a draw. So it's possible that uh, Jing Chuang here, he wanted to just vary and create something new. It's possible he just didn't really remember the line, which is which is possible. Um, but he plays instead c6, and I think that c6, you'll see here, is inferior. So when Nun plays c5, Yasser sets up this plan in motion to play like rook b1 and b4 and try to chip away at the c5 pawn. So it's interesting to see how Yasser reacts to c6 here. He basically plays as if like he's a step ahead of the game and plays b4. Just, you know, not really allowing black to comfortably play c5. If c5, he can take on c5, create a protected pass pawn at d5, and then kind of have a positional advantage that he could slowly increase. But um, because black hasn't played c5, the knight at d4 isn't really that stable. And it's not relevant the fact that the bishop's protecting it indirectly on a long diagonal because this bishop on h4 is pinning the guy on f6. So JJ Chuan here plays rook e8, but you know, this this move is this feels like black doesn't really know what to do, doesn't have a clear plan, just kind of hanging around. And uh, and then Yasser plays rook b1. Prophylactic moves by both sides. Now I would imagine here that white stands slightly better and uh, black needs to be very very careful and very patient. Um, if you think about the position in terms of classical chess strategy, we have a position where white has a space advantage with d5 in the center. Um, it's similar to maybe like an advanced French where white plays e5, has the advantage on the king's side. Nimzovich would play e5 in the French, have a space advantage on the king's side, and then that would be his strong point. You would try to undermine white's pawn chain, but from the base. We see here kind of a no-no, you know, in the King's Indian, strategically, Jing Chuan here playing c6, trying to chip away at the head of the pawn chain. Now, according to principles laid out by Nimzovich, this is incorrect. He's basically attacking the strong part of the pawn chain. In fact, in many cases, this kind of plan in the King's Indian, all it does is like open the c-file for white. If black plays d takes c, c takes d, that's, that's something that white often strives to do. So sometimes when you play c6 as black in the King's Indian, because you don't have a plan, you don't have a concrete idea of what you're doing, you're actually helping white by possibly opening lines, opening lines on the queen side where white has more space to operate. And now it gets worse because Jing Jing Chuan here plays a5. And classical trainers will tell you that in the King's Indian, most of the time, the idea is to, to play on, on your stronger side, on the king's side, where you have the strong point on e5. And 
in most cases, I would say 75, 80% of the time, it's a bad idea to try to play on the queen side, as, as black has here with c6 and a5. It looks cool to open squares up for your pieces, you know, c6 opens up the queen on d8 to come out, a5 opens up the rook on a8. But Sirwan is not, you know, wasn't born yesterday, and he's not going to just let, you know, black take over the game. I mean, I'm sure that white could play a3 here, you know, have a reasonable position after something like a3, a takes b, a takes b. But black's getting a little bit active with moves like rook a3, like in an accelerated dragon or something like that. So Sirwan does something very interesting here. He takes on c6, and... There are two openings where this really seems uh, familiar to me. One, it sometimes happens in the Leningrad Dutch, where white takes on c6 and plays b5 to get control of the d5 square. It also happens in the King's Indian. There's a very, very good book by Samuel Ryshevsky called The Art of Positional Play. And in that book, he highlights one game where I believe um, he was playing white against Gligorich, if I'm not mistaken, just off the top of my head. Um, I think he was playing white against Gligorich, but Sammy just did the same thing. You know, this is something that Yasser probably saw a million times in his games. He thinks very, very much in terms of strategic play and, and pawn structure chess. Yasser is strong tactically, but that's not his, his main focus. His main focus on, is on strategic play. And so Yasser goes immediately for this plan to, um, to create a weak square on d5. That's what this is all about. And it, it's straight out of Dimzovich, really. I mean, if you think about the way that Dimzovich would play the advanced French with white, and uh, and then trade on uh, trade the strong point on, on f6, and then trade the other strong point on d4, on c5, and then use those squares for his pieces, white has control, strong control of d5, and he's now going to turn that strong point with his pawn into a strong point for his pieces, because black has basically opened up lines on, on the wrong side of the board. And this, this creates a clear advantage for white. So takes, takes, and then b5. And I don't know who was the first player to do this. Maybe it was Ryshevsky. Probably it was someone before him. But Yasser understands what's going on here. So the, the situation is difficult for black because he doesn't know how to react. I mean, I guess you could play c5 and try to keep things closed up on the queen side. I don't think that would be that terrible, but... Ultimately, white has a protected pass pawn on b5, and that's something I've seen Sarawan use in other positions too. Um, coming to mind is like Yasser playing the white side of, of um, the Bogo Indian, for example. Sarawan would play variations of the Bogo Indian where he would expand on the queen side with, with b4, and, uh, and black would play c5, and he would play b5, and he likes this kind of protected pass pawn on the queen side, naturally. So low risk position for the white side of the King's Indian with a strategic advantage of the d5 square and the queen side majority. So again, straight out of this art of positional play by Ryshevsky. Um, Black tries to keep the tension, which probably isn't a bad idea. And now Serwan is, is pretty patient. You know, he doesn't want to take on d4 and uh, open, up, um, open up all kinds of problems where Black gets counterplay along the e-file. So Yasser is very patient here. He just sort of strengthens his position with f3. So giving his bishop retreat squares back to f2. And one thing that's notable about this particular variation, I would recommend it to anyone to play this line because basically this bishop d3 against the king's Indian, it's semi-aggressive, but at the same time, very solid. And you might notice if you look through all the games, it's very, very hard for black to get a kingside attack in this particular line. And I think that's one of the things that the Yasser likes about it. So now black backs off with knight e6. A bit of a weird plan in a sense. But he, he wanted to uh, transfer to this blockade with a knight going to c5. And now a very, very powerful plan by Sarawan, which 99% of chess players wouldn't have found. He doesn't want to just sit around forever he wants to make progress and force black to give up that d5 square but black is not giving way he's not taking on b5 and Serawan doesn't really want to take on c6 so he plays bishop c2 this isn't only about preserving his bishop because his bishop he can afford to give up this is a bad bishop 
it's it's on the white squares white has lots of pawns on the white squares like a marazzi or something like that there are several reasons for the move i mean i think first of all yasser wants to get play you know this is a second way to win the game basically he can get just pressure against the backward pawn on d6 and the other thing is that the bishop is avoiding getting exchanged off by knight to c5 and i think that finally we'll see the, the real answer here a creative idea black plays rook c8 and bishop a4 and this is a true positional maestro we're looking at here i mean bishop a4 carving his way into this black position on the white squares so very very effective winning the white squares is often the way to beat the king's indian notice yasser leaving black with a very bad dark squared bishop this is a characteristic problem in the black side of the king's indian when you play e5 that bishop needs to get into the game and it is a characteristic problem it is a problem for the rest of the game here for Ye Ching Chuan. so we'll see what happens now black plays knight to c5 and then white takes on c6 and bishop takes c6 this is a good exchange for white bad bishop for good bishop he's got ironclad control of d5 but yasser doesn't rush here he could just play bishop takes bishop and be slightly better but that leaves him with an isolani on c4 which is a real liability so he just slowly plays bishop b5 i mean he's saying okay i can trade bishops whenever i want but i prefer if you would take on b5 let me to take on b5 with a c4 pawn and the problem for black he's in a very awkward situation you know he'd like to avoid the exchange of bishops he really would i'm sure if he could he would play bishop a8 or something like that but the problem is the rook and black just doesn't have that much space to operate you know rookie seven puts his rook in a pin rookie six is a bad square so it's just hard to avoid this exchange of, of white squared bishops it's a long game now queen d7 and queen d2 Yasser identifies the weak points in Black's position with queen d2. He's like a, basically a triple threat. I mean, look at this queen move. He's looking at h6, he's looking at d6, and he's looking at a5. Something is, is about to fall for Black here. He may just like lose a pawn. So this is a very appropriate move, queen d2, in any case with the idea of rook d1, building up on the open file. So now Black concretely takes on b5. Wait, as not a protected pass pawn but it's it's close to being a protected pass pawn with a4 and so one would imagine that um, black could consider a4 here it's just that he's going to lose a pawn with bishop takes f6 and um, queen takes h6 so g5 is out of the question it's just too weakening it would weaken the the f5 square not an option king h7 this bishop is still very sorry and here, I think that Yasser played um, a little bit too quickly with bishop takes f6. I might have done the same thing. It's a temptation. It's a very simple solution to the position. It's risk-free. But I think he could have squeezed a little bit more out of this, you know, probably. One thing to consider is a4. Ensuring that your b5 pawn is, is like a, a protected pass pawn for the rest of your life. You know, I think that a4 has to be considered. Let's take a look what the computer thinks here. Um, certainly it couldn't have hurt to play rook on f to d1 just piling up the pressure black can't really do anything I don't think Yasser has to fear g5 so it really feels like yeah black has nothing better than maybe rook e6 or some awkward move at this point it looks like he rushed things a little bit with the oversimplified bishop takes f6 a good exchange in general but doing it this way, this bishop actually gets to the Sveshnikov type of position now. If you ask me what this opening was, well, I mean, I think that most people would look at it and say, well, yeah, I mean, this was clearly a Sveshnikov. It looks like it was a Sveshnikov. Black's played e5, d6. You know, white has the queenside majority pushed up. There's this bishop on f6, maybe going to g5. Black's played g6, so the idea of f5. So it doesn't really look like a King's Indian. It looks like a pretty good Sveshnikov for white. And positionally, white is clearly better. But maybe this was just a little too lazy for white, you know, to play bishop takes f6. He could have had more. Um, and then knight to d5. Again, slightly weird move. Um, I would have probably bought, brought more pressure to bear with a useful developing move here. Rook f d1. So knight to d5. And then here black has a choice, but he was worried about the a5 pawn. So I suppose it's necessary 
you, know, you could consider bishop g5, but I don't really see any compensation. Um, I guess there's some complications with bishop g5, queen takes a5, rook a8. That's a variation to consider. So I'm not sure what Yasser would have done. Maybe he would have just not taken the pawn and played like queen d1 in the event of bishop g5. But it's kind of complicated. There's bishop g5, queen takes a5, rook a8. Let's take a look for a second here. Bishop g5, queen takes a5, rook a8. And then th that's the question, what do we do now? We're up a pawn, black's going to win back the pawn on a2. We have a very strong passed pawn. So I'm sure that Yasser was looking at this, but afraid that black was getting some counterplay. So that's the real question. I don't know. It looks better for white, but he thought maybe I can get more if I'm patient. So anyway, black played bishop to d8, and then white plays b6. Now this move is very committal, but because the knight is on c5, white can't play a4. And there's a famous saying, pass pawns must be pushed. I'm not certain that's the case here necessarily, and white could build up with rook d1 or knight to c3, preparing like a4, but I don't think there's anything wrong with b6. It's always a risk though, when you advance a pawn like this, that could potentially be a protected pass pawn by another pawn, the pawn gets a little bit lonely there on b6. It's under fire, and this leads to trouble later on. This was a good move, I thought, by Yang Jingchuan to play a4, slowing down White's chances of creating two connected pass pawns. Um, he has to defend the pawn anyway. So at this point, uh, White tries to improve. Maybe this is too fancy. I don't know. He plays knight c1. But it makes a lot of sense to me. Perhaps there was something more direct. He's always got to watch for bishop g5. And, and if you play rook c1, which is a natural move, you're walking into like bishop g5. So white has to be careful. Maybe time pressure was setting in, I don't know, but I kind of like knight c1. I mean, white's looking at the position like, I've got a monster knight, it's a classic position, um, like strategically, practically winning. And if I can trade his one good minor piece off for my not so great minor piece, it will just be a clear situation um, where, where white is just dominating with the powerful piece. So bishop g5, now black gets a little bit of counterplay here. I wasn't sure why Serawan chose d1 per se. I guess um, it doesn't make that much difference, but I, I felt like queen e2 was a little bit more active than d1. I know it gets in the way of the rook. It bothers me a little bit that queen on d1 interferes with his rook. It's kind of a, a toss-up. A computer thinks it's basically 50-50. I would have preferred queen e2 but Yasser played queen d1, and now knight b7. This this was a strange move in a sense, but he's blockading, and he's also creating the potential of counterplay for black along the c-file. So overall, this this was not a one-sided game. Ye Jingchuan did the best he could to get counterplay, and he, he's blockading here. A passive-looking move, but getting counterplay with the rooks. Um, knight d3, and now rook c4. And these knights are on sort of the same wavelength and, and inter interfering with each other, competing over the same square in a sense. So it's a little hard for white to get unraveled there. He defends his c4 pawn. Black's trying to double rooks, get some counterplay, and then rook b4. I think this is not a bad move. White has a clear strategic advantage, so trading pieces is actually in his interest. The more pieces that are exchanged, the more relevant this like monster pass pawn on the 6th rank really should should be. Um, rook takes b4, knight takes b4. Redundant knights, though, not really ideal for Serawan. Uh, rook c8, getting control of the file, and then queen e2. Again, maybe queen d3 possible there. Let, let's take a look what the computer engine thinks. Um, queen e2 is good. Queen d3 is was a possible candidate move. Okay. Knight d3. Again, the knights are kind of redundant. You know, they're not great. The knight on b4 is not great. The knight on d5 is great. We'd rather get them better coordinated. Um, so he plays queen e2, then knight c5. And I think this is virtually winning for white. But putting black away is not so easy. I think at this point they're probably playing a 40 move time control. So they're, they're getting into time pressure very likely. Yasser are spending a lot of time trying to find you know the best positional plan. It's not a tactical position. Sometimes moves and plans take a long time to find for a player like that. Um, so knight a6, again, the same theme. Trading off black's best minor piece looks like a good idea. And he goes out of his way to avoid it. So good practical play by, uh, by black here. Avoiding exchanges, you know, avoiding going to a simplified ending where he's worse. He really put up a good fight. 
Um, and then knight c7, threatening to just kind of block black's play along the c-file and trade pieces ultimately. So black reverts to blockading the pawn, queen b5. And this was really a key moment. It's possible that Yasser missed something here because it looks like black miraculously is holding on with best play after queen b5. This move was in, insanely difficult to find. Um, you know, visually, a strategic player like Sarawan isn't looking for moves like rook c1. You know, rook c1 makes sense, but it's hanging the rook. I would have probably missed this as well because it's all based on the tactic knight f6, knight on d5 to f6 check, winning the queen. White can play rook c1, getting the rook to a very active role along the c-file. And white has a clear advantage there, probably about winning with his passed pawn on the queen side and more active pieces. But we didn't see that, so he goes to trade queens. I could see myself doing this as well. And surprisingly, after queen takes queen, knight takes, as bad as black's position looks, as powerful as that pawn looks, as I said, it's not a protected passed pawn. It's kind of lonely, and black is saving the game, it looks like, with bishop d8. Now, Sirwan may have miscalculated here. Maybe he forgot it was like check, or he thought he had something else, or he thought the following move was good enough. Um, because knight takes d6, bishop takes b6 check, looks looks like it's absolutely equal. White has no choice here but to play knight c7. And at this point, it looks like black missed a really, really good shot to draw with knight f8. This was a hard move to find, though. Backwards moves uh, when defending tend to be difficult to find. But it makes a lot of sense. Like, this third piece will go in and harass that b6 pawn again. All the black's pieces kind of passive, but just in time to harass the pawn on, on b6. And unfortunately, the king is on g1, and a lot of times the b6 pawn is getting chopped with check. So it looks like black could have held on with knight f8, knight d7 here, surprising as it is. Um, he plays instead king f8. This is a natural move to try to improve his worst piece, but it's not really fast enough. And now white plays rook c1. He's ready to play rook to c6, which looks really strong. So black, king f8. Now, king f1, I don't know. I mean, rook c6 looks strong to me. It had to be some kind of hallucination Sarawan had. I mean, when he played rook c1, I'm certain that, you know, the plan is to go rook c6. And then for some reason, you know, his his intuition just told him, oh, or he started to see ghosts. Um, it's very strange. But rook c6 looks like it's just game over. I don't really see a defense here. So instead, he reflexively, perhaps in time pressure, most likely explanation, um, didn't play the winning move rook c6. He played king f1. And this gives black enough time. He now blockades the c-file. His king is close enough. And it's suddenly really, really difficult for white to break through. So it's like white has to basically win the game all over again here. He plays king e2. I thought this was fine. Blockade. Um, and then backs off with knight to b5. And this... This seems to be like a mistake, a major mistake. Again, we're really close to the time control. So move 39, most likely a time pressure blunder. White should just slowly try to improve his position, maybe a3, g3, and slowly improve the king. Um, perhaps something like rook b1, followed by rook b5, rook a5, I would imagine. That's actually one of the computer's top lines, yeah. This looks right, rook b1, rook b5, sort of infiltrating um, on the white squares, maybe even here in some positions, depending on, on the situation. And actually, there's an exchange sacrifice here the computer just found, which is really monstrous. Rook takes c5, pawn takes c5, and king d3. You know, this is the kind of, excuse me, this is the kind of thing, I mean, he was probably thinking about getting into time pressure. But this looks like really, really, really strong. If Yasser had had more time, if it hadn't been move 39, it's very possible he would have found this. Um, by the way, one note on that kind of concept. Exchange sacrifices in, uh, in positions where you have the initiative. Oftentimes, that is the winning mechanism. And it usually involves sacrificing an active piece for this passive blockading kind of defender. So surprisingly here, the point is, how do I get the king in? This is how I get the king in. Rook takes knight and king goes in through the white squares. Yasser just didn't have enough time, so he blundered with, with this knight to b5. Black, presumably also in very bad time pressure, missed taking on b6, which seems to be okay for him. I mean, 
it's just looking like bishop takes b6, knight takes d6, and then we make some kind of defensive move. Rook b8, and perhaps he just thought he was getting pinned and losing or something like rook b1, but he has bishop a7, and because of the black king's position, this looks like it might be a torturous ending for black. I'm not saying this would be easy to draw a Yasser with this position. It doesn't look like a lot of fun with uh, the pawn kind of extended on a4. And, uh, but objectively, it might, be, it might be a situation where black could hold on because there aren't that, many, aren't that many pawns left on the board. Okay, not easy, but it was probably his best chance. Black was afraid to, to go into that ending, understandably. Um, so he played a, another random move here. This is move 39, obviously a very bad move. Both players in time pressure, and then white, knight to a3, king e8, and this is like time control, and now knight to c4, and white is winning again. Rook b8, rook b1, and then the king comes in. And so white still needs to make progress here. I'm not sure it's that easy, because it's so blocked. And now the black king is coming to the aid um, of the position. So in the event of rook b5, it looks like king c6. Rook b5, king c6. Black is holding on. Actually, the engine doesn't like that. Oh, you can't play king c6 because of some tricks? I'm not really sure. Oh, rook takes c5? I don't know, understand what's wrong with this move. Maybe nothing. Maybe just rook a5, yeah. It just doesn't really help black, I suppose, the king on c6. So anyway, it's a difficult position for black to save here. Um, in the actual game, let's see, right, we have this continuation, knight b7, and then rook b4, going after the pawn, knight c5, and both players have made the time control now. White should be able to win this with a very good control of d5, um, passed pawn, but the passed pawn has to be constantly protected, so it wasn't that easy. Bishop d8. Knight takes a4, and this is interesting. Knight takes a4, rook takes a4. And then surprisingly here, black decided not to take the pawn on b6. The computer you can't really trust in this position because this is an ending that you um, that you really have to base your analysis on long, long variations. Um, we're talking about like king and pawn end games where maybe white is winning because the outside a pawn will distract the black king. So I, I don't really trust the computer here. Um, but in any case, it looks like black's only chance really is taking that pawn on b6. If he doesn't take the pawn on b6, he's simply going to lose. So I, 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 I'm stunned that he didn't actually capture on b6. Instead, he played king c6, you know, hoping to take it maybe a move later. But I think it gives white too many options. This is only move, and presumably he was afraid of rook b4 and the following endgame. The king and pawn endgame is lost for black, so he must avoid that with something like bishop a7. And now the real question is this endgame. Rook takes, bishop takes, um, and then maybe knight, knight e3. You know, Yijing Chiwan was afraid this is lost, but I'm not that certain. Because the bishop is a good piece as, as far as, as dealing with outside past pawns. You know, he's much better off having a bishop here, albeit a bad one. Than, uh, than a knight or something like that. I mean, this is probably not not necessarily winning for white. Um, yes, he has practical chances, but it's going to be hard, you know, for the king to to get past c4. And um, how is he going to promote that pawn exactly? I mean, white would really have to have his pieces on the perfect squares. Something like king king c4, knight b5, pawn on, like a5, a6, try to distract black and win. It's not clear to me this is enough. But instead, Ye Ching Chuan didn't take the pawn, which is really, you know, hard to understand, and play king c6, king d3, and it doesn't get any better from here. Now, you know, now it's a different situation. I mean, still he has to try it, but there's a problem. See, now with his king on c6, the problem is that bishop takes b6 is no longer met by rook b4. Bishop takes b6 is now met by rook a6, trading all the pieces into a winning king and pawn ending. So there is no defense for black. He plays f5 and then rook b4, and I think it's over now. I really don't think there's, 
There's realistic defense here. King c5, rook b3. And it looks like it's just too connected past pawns. Black doesn't have enough counterplay. So he eventually blunders here. d5, knight takes e5, rook b7, and then a4. And then here, bishop f6 is, is just an overt blunder, allowing rook b5 check. But objectively, black was lost. I think once white established those two connected past pawns finally. So a lot of mishaps around the time control. And this is the final position. Um, knight to c4 resigns. Obviously, it's over now. Black is down three pawns. There's two connectors on the queen side. But Ye Chuan had some chances to draw, probably, although some of those endings very unpleasant. The critical one, this even material ending with the dark squared bishop um, and white having this outside a pawn. Knights are not notoriously great with outside pawns, whereas bishops are. So I have the feeling that might yet be a draw. Black was reluctant to go into it, but it was probably his only chance. And earlier, he could have taken the b6 pawn with real drawing chances. But this is all beside the point. I think this was an excellent strategic game, um, really, really illustrating the value of having a space advantage and then the other player trying to play on your strong side. What he effectively did was open open up space for you, your play on that side of the board. Black never had any King's Indian type of play on the King's side. All the play was on the Queen's side. Black's King's Indian Bishop was very bad. And all he did was give the d5 square to white as a huge outpost. Black suffered and then eventually lost. Really excellent positional play by Grandmaster Yasser Serwan. Again, this was from China 2003. Yasser Serwan versus Ye Jing Chuan. I'm International Master William Pascal. This is Grandmaster Lessons from the Past, Part 1, here on my YouTube channel. Video chess training on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe and like the channel and like the video. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.